Dr. Ken and Bear here with a lecture from my Roman history class, although anyone's welcome to watch. Um, my Roman history class, of course, will have the notes and slides, which you won't necessarily. We'll let her get down now, and um, I'll get started. This is a lecture on the second triumvirate, um, and to, to some extent as well on Mark Antony and Cleopatra. So um, I'm going to go through uh, <coughs> elements of both, <coughs> pardon me, elements of all three rather, because they interconnect quite profoundly. So um, what's going on? Well, of course, Julius Caesar is dead. Um, and as we saw, Cicero is, is dead as well. And Antony and Octavian have joined together. Let's retrace steps a little bit and see how this came about. So, on the um, 17th of March, 44 B BC, the Senate doesn't appear to have been able to take a consistent position um, after Caesar's assassination. They decreed that the assassins were to be immune from punishment, but that Caesar's acts as head of state, including his will, were to be ratified, and he was to have a public funeral. So a kind of best of both worlds scenario. Caesar wasn't declared a tyrant, uh, but the acts of the liberators were considered to be valid. Um, at the funeral, Brutus spoke first. Uh, however, when Antony spoke, recalling the conditions of Caesar's will, which left 300,000 sesterces to each Roman citizen, um, as well as his magnificent gardens to the people as, as a public park, um, the mob was inflamed, and so inflamed that Caesar's body, as we saw, was burned then and there um, in the Campus Martius. Um, and anger, <coughs> the anger of the mob, <coughs> pardon me, turned towards the conspirators as well uh, around this time. Within a month, the conspirators, the liberatores, had left the city for the east uh, because of their unpopularity in Rome. Uh, led by Brutus and Cassius, they began to raise money um, and an army in Greece, allying with Sextus Pompey. This is Pompey's son, who is now a, a pirate chieftain. He was the youngest son of Pompey Magnus, um, as, as we saw before. In April 44 BC, Caesar's 19-year-old uh, great-nephew, Gaius Octavius Thurinus, entered Rome to claim his inheritance. Caesar's will had named him um, chief heir and adopted him as his son legally, making his name now Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. So modern historians uh, usually refer to him as Octavian until he receives the title of Augustus in 27 BC. We'll come to that in time. The Senate posthumously deified Julius Caesar. <clears throat> Um, and, um, and a temple would be eventually erected in his honor. Uh, and this then allowed Octavian to claim the title uh, Philius Divus Iulius, uh, or Philius Divi, Philius, there we go, Philius the son Divi Iuli of the divine Julius. Um, and this would be something he made a great deal of. Uh, of capital out of it, I should say. Yes. Um, his claim, however, was not ratified by Mark Antony. Antony had Caesar's will, and he in initially obstructs Octavian from um, from claiming his inheritance. What do we know uh, about him? Well, uh, early on in his life, um, well, Octavian, I should say, was born 23 December. 63 BC, son of a man from Valatriae who had been who had reached the praetorship before dying unexpectedly. Um, his father Octavian had, had had earned the hand of Atia, who was the daughter of Caesar's sister Julia, and that was the family link between uh, young Octavian and and Julius Caesar. Um, it's difficult to say what sort of relationship Octavian had with Julius Caesar at a young age, except that there clearly was one. Um, so we have a source like Cassius Dio claiming that after Octavian reached maturity in 48, Caesar took him in and began training him to be his successor, taking him on campaign with him, <clears throat> um, etc. 
and um, in 48 BC he had young Octavian elected to the Pontifical College. When Caesar celebrated his multiple triumphs in September of 46, Octavian part, took part in the procession and was also accorded military honors. Sometime in this period, Octavian is also in, in, inducted into the patrician order. His family had, had sort of fallen out of that, but he's brought back into it by Caesar. He then followed Caesar into Spain when the latter went to war with the Pompeians at Munda in 45 BC and earned the admiration of the dictator for the, his, his daring for the daring of his journey, which included a shipwreck uh, as well. So, you know, daring young man. Uh, in 44, Caesar nominated the magistrates several years in advance, another shunning of tradition by the dictator, um, and the young man was included as his master of horse for 43 and 42 BC. Despite these indications of favor, it's fair to say uh, that in the broad scheme of things, Octavian was a non-player and a political nobody in March of 44 when his great uncle was killed. When he heard about um, Caesar's murder, he was in Ap Apollonia in Illyricum preparing to join Caesar on his Parthian campaign. Um, his friends and some senior army officers urged him to take refuge with the army in Macedonia. His family advised that he lie low, come to Rome unthreateningly as a private citizen. He opted for the latter course of action and arrived in southern Italy, south of Brindisium. There, uh, he heard more details about Caesar's death and his own adoption. His family, now fearful for his life, urged him to renounce the adoption and inheritance in order to secure his personal safety. In a tremendous act of daring, he instead made directly for, for Brindisium um, with a large and a large concentration of troops there. So this really represents his, marks his entrance into politics during this period. Um, by virtue of his adoption, um, following Roman custom, Octavian now assumed the name Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. Thereafter, thereafter Octavian, as I say, just to identify him or separate him from um, his later titles. Antony apparently paid little attention to him. Oh, I should, I should add as well that he, Octavian playing up on the connection with, with his, div his divine adopted father, uh, preferred to be just called Caesar. Um, so taking full advantage of that. Antony paid no attention to him, at least officially. Um, Antony was still deeply occupied with several important matters, not the least being to secure powerful provinces for himself while downgrading those of Cassius and Brutus. Uh, thus, when Octavian finally entered Rome toward the end of April, Antony continued to ignore him. Octavian kept his cool, um, arranged a meeting. When he showed up ironically in the gardens of Pompey on the Alpian Hill, he was pointedly kept waiting. The ex ensuing exchange didn't go well. In subsequent weeks, Antony blocked Octavian's move to have his adoption officially recognized and also prevented him from standing for public office. But Octavian earned the favor of the crowd and tensions with Antony rose. Um, events in northern Italy brought matters to a head, though, between the Caesarian camp and the liberators, and between Antony and Octavian. So Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus had been a supporter of Caesar's, as well as one of his assassins. The dictator had appointed him to the governorship of Cisalpine Gaul, which is roughly the Po Valley region of, of modern Italy today. This appointment was confirmed by the Senate in ratifying Caesar's acts. Um, they also assigned Antony, consul in 44, the province of Macedonia. Through tribunician legislation in 44 BC, June of 44, Antony had his command to Macedonia exchanged for that of the more powerful Cisalpine Gaul. Um, Decimus Brutus's term was up at the end of 44, but Antony decided to assume command of Cisalpine Gaul in November. Decimus Brutus resisted and was supported by the Senate largely well disposed towards liberators whom it regarded as tyrannicides. Um, against this backdrop of, of sort of looming crises uh, between the Caesareans and liberators, the relationship between Antony and Octavian uh, deteriorated further. Antony accused Octavian of plotting against him while Octavian attempted through his agents to undermine the loyalty of the army that Antony was bringing to Italy from Macedonia. Antony went to Brundisium to secure the army. Things did not go well there for him. 
at which juncture Octavian showed his daring once more. Um, despite the risk of being branded a public enemy, he toured the Caesarian colonies of Campania and relying on old loyalties, raised a private army from among Caesar's veterans, perhaps about 10,000 strong, um, following Pompey's footsteps in some respects. It was a vivid demonstration of the power of the name Caesar. Antony, meanwhile, returned to Rome and intended to denounce Octavian to the Senate when he heard that two of his five legions from Macedonia had defected to Octavian. Fearing the worst, he took the remainder of his forces and hastened to attack Decimus Brutus in Cisalpine Gaul. This was highly volatile. Decimus Brutus, backed by the Senate, was, was resisting Antony under arms um, and retired to the fortified town of Mutina in Cisalpine Gaul. Antony had four legions, Octavian had five. All the armed parties were mutually antagonistic. The Senate, led by Cicero in his last great political action, identified Antony as the greater threat. Cicero and Antony were now on opposing sides, following an acrimonious oratorical exchange um, uh, in the Senate that started in September of 44. We saw some of the Philippics last time, you'll, you may recall. At this crucial juncture, then, Cicero deployed his considerable rhetorical skill to Octavian's benefit and began to champion his cause as a foil to Antony's rising power. As a result, on the 1st of January, 43 BC, Octavian's essentially illegal command of men under arms was legitimized with a grant of pro-praetorian power. So he's not given proconsular power, he's given pro-praetorian power, a kind of unprecedented uh, thing for his age, but nonetheless, it legitimizes his army. Um, and then he goes off to fight Antony. So in two engagements in April, Antony was bested and fled over the Alps to his political allies in Transalpine Gaul. Both consuls, though, for 43, Hirtius and Panza, however, per perished in the fighting around Mutina, and Octavian, as the senior commander on the spot, refused to cooperate any further with Decimus Brutus, who had been, of course, a murderer of his adopted father. The senators, it appears, hoped that Octavian would now just go away. They appointed Decimus Brutus to overall command against Antony, issued decrees of public thanks to him, and palmed Octavian off with an ovation. When a commission to distribute land to veterans was set up, Octavian was pointedly omitted. Smarting at such insulting treatment, Octavian bided his time and put in request for a consulship with Cicero as his colleague and a triumph. Meanwhile, Antony was preparing to return to Cisalpine Gaul with enormous forces gained from Caesarian commanders in Transalpine Gaul. The situation remained unstable. In the face of these developments, Octavian once more acted. Um, with courage um, and determination, even if with shocking directness, having secured the army's loyalty, he marched on Rome and seized the city with eight legions. Three legions brought from outside Italy to counter him defected. Unsurprisingly, Octavian was elected consul to replace the deceased consuls of 43. He now carried out the long-delayed ratification of his adoption um, and paid out the remainder of Caesar's legacy. Uh, in his will, revoked the amnesty for the liberators and tried and convicted them en masse and in absentia in a single day. Um, despite his control of Rome, Octavian's position was, was somewhat perilous, uh, but then in October of 43 BC, he meets with Mark Antony and another man named Marcus Lepidus, uh, where they form the Second Triumvirate. So much to Cicero's surprise, instead of destroying Antony, Octavian aligns with him. Um, unlike the first triumvirate, the second triumvirate is officially sanctioned uh, by, by law, by explicit arrangement of special powers intended to last for only five years um, and passed into law by the Roman tribunes. The Lex Titia, as it was called, was passed on, the, on November 27th of 43 BC. It legalized the triumvirate um, of these three men and uh, it created this three-man commission for restoring the constitution of the republic. Triumvari re republicae constituendi. Uh, so yes, the, the, the purpose of it ostensibly is to restore the ailing republic. Um, in actual fact, it created a junta of these three men uh, who, who were effectively totally in charge of the Roman Empire.
They had the power to make or annul laws without approval from either the Senate or the people. Um, this insulated their, their judicial decisions from appeal and allowed the triumvirs uh, to name magistrates as well. Although the constitutional machinery of the Republic was not irrevocably dismantled by the Lex Titia, uh, in any case, it never recovered. The triumvirs got a series of proscriptions, set a series of proscriptions in motion, um, and Cassius Dio describes uh, how that went. And I've put that in the notes, quite a long speech, we're, we're a long selection, but we've, we saw how um, allegedly Octavian spent about two or three days trying to convince Mark Antony not to put Cicero on the list, but he did anyway. Um, who was the third member of the triumvirate? Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. Well, he was very much the junior partner um, of, the, of the second triumvirate. He was the son of a man named also Marcus, named Marcus Aemilius Lepidus as well, who had been consul in 78, um, and he used his family name and uh, influenced to his political benefit during the later days of the Republic. He had been a praetor, joining Julius Caesar in the Civil War against the Senate and, and Pompey the Great. Um, as a result, Lepidus was given the consulship in 46. In 44, he was given the governorship of Gallia, Gallia rather, Narbonensis and Hispania Cateria. Following Caesar's assassination on the Ides of March 44 BC, he emerged as, the, as one of the most feared men in Roman politics, just by virtue of his position. Um, he also held the title of Pontifex Maximus. He apparently had been near Rome at the time of the assassination and immediately allied himself with Mark Antony, helping to stabilize the city and the chaos that followed. Uh, with the, uh, the aid of Antony, Lepidus assumed the office of Pontifex Maximus, which had been previously held by Caesar. So, in, in a way, Lepidus was, was part of the parcel, if you like, with, with Antony. So, for, for, you know, for Octavian to join forces with Antony, he needed to have Lepidus on side as well. And Lepidus, I think, would remain loyal to Antony and, and, and never really come to terms with Octavian. Um, and he'll help out. We'll come back to him and, and how he falls, because it's sort of falling out with um, the triumvirs. So what goes on with the civil war that, that then erupts between the liberators and... Octavian and Antony and Lepidus. Well, uh, we have Marcus Junius Brutus and Gaius Cassius Longinus, principal instigators of the Liberatores, uh, leading in the conflict or the civil war that, that then emerges. Who was Brutus? Um, he claimed ascendancy from Lucius Junius, Lucius Junius Brutus, known as the ancient Brutus, who is said to have helped found the Roman Republic by kicking out the last king, Tarquin the Proud. Um, pardon me. Um, he apparently was part of a conspiracy to kill Pompey in 59 BC. Um, oh, sorry. In, sorry, in 59 BC, a man named Vettius accused Brutus of being part of a conspiracy. In fact, there doesn't appear to have been one. This, this may have been some, some attempt to um, create a split in politics between them. Cato the Younger was the half-brother of Brutus's mother, Servilia. Brutus admired his uncle Cato for his moral integrity, stubbornness in standing up for what he thought was right, and legendary hatred of bribery. He considered himself the natural enemy of Julius Caesar. And as I've, I've suggested before, Servilia, his mother, seems to have been one of Caesar's lovers. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, and it may well be the case that Brutus was, was, was Caesar's son. We don't know if that's true, and if it was true, we don't know that, that Brutus knew. Um, he might, it might have been true, and he might have known, and he might have hated his father as a result. We don't know. Um, but Brutus, and, Brutus, along with his colleague Cassius, of course, were part of the Liberatores, who assassinated Caesar. Um, and Brutus and Cassius' armies would, would then fight against the triumvirs, um, famously at the Battle of Philippi in 42 BC in Macedonia. The other one, Long Cassius Longinus, Gaius Cassius Longinus, not a lot is known of him. Um, as a, He was a quaestor in 53. Um, he served under Marcus Licinius Crassus and saved the remnants of that army that, that was defeated 
um, by the Parthians at Karhai, um, and for the next two years he successfully repelled Parthian attacks in Syria. He was a tribune in 49, um, and, the, and the outbreak of the civil war between Caesar and the Optimates in that year saved him from being brought to trial for extortion of funds in Syria, apparently. Um, Cassius was reconciled to Caesar after that civil war, and it was Caesar who made him one of his legates, so he owed his position to Caesar. Uh, in 44, he became Praetor Peregrinus and was promised the governorship of Syria for the following year, um, although things would change after the assassination of Caesar. And, <clears throat> as I say, he, uh, along with with Brutus would then lead forces at Philippi against the Triumvir. So what happens at Philippi? In October of 42 BC, Octavian sends his army to Greece, where Brutus and Cassius, uh, the architects of Caesar's assassination, had established a power base. Antony and Octavian led 19 or 20 legions, met the 19 legions of Brutus and Cassius at Philippi. In the first battle, Antony's forces defeated Cassius's troops, um, but Brutus's forces defeated those of Octavian's. Cassius, not knowing about Brutus' success, committed suicide. Ah! Brutus did not follow up his advantage immediately, though, and a second, a second battle was fought three weeks later, with Brutus facing the combined forces of Antony and Octavian, and was defeated. When he was defeated, he committed suicide, marking the ultimate end of the Republican cause. Um, and I put in the notes a quote from Cassius Dio, uh, that, saying essentially that... that that Brutus preferred death to making some kind of peace with the victors. Following these battles, then, the new territorial arrangement was established. We call the Second Triumvirate, dividing up the world, as it were, between the triumvirs. You'll note that Antony and Octavian get the lion's share of, of the Roman Empire at this point. Lepidus gets a much smaller share, but that's sort of relative to his, I suppose, overall contribution. Um, worth talking about Mark Antony somewhat at this point, um, and Cleopatra as well. So it, it, it bears some, some discussion about Antony himself. Who, who was Antony? Uh, well, he was born in Rome uh, around 83 BC from a very prominent family of some fame. His grandfather of the same name was a supporter of Sulla um, and was executed by Marius before Antony's birth. <clears throat> his father, known for his campaigns against the uh, Eastern pirates, died when Antony was quite young. Uh, through his mother, Julius Cazaris, however, Antony was distantly related to Julius Caesar, and this carried considerable weight in his early career. Antony's mother uh, remarried Publius Cornelius Lintulus, who was executed by Cicero in 63 BC uh, as a result of the Catiline conspiracy, and this would be a key event in uh, Antony's life, which set up his relationship with Cicero, or rather against Cicero. Now, um, a lot of what I'm telling you about Antony comes from Plutarch, and Plutarch's principal source on Antony is Cicero. Um, so, how much of it is true, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm convinced that Cicero exaggerates somewhat in his description of Antony, but only somewhat, so I suspect, you know, in, in most cases there's a you know, the larger portion of it is probably true, um, but we can't be certain about that. So bear that in mind. What I'm telling you mostly comes from Plutarch, and Plutarch is getting it from Cicero. So in his youth, we're told that Antony was known to keep dubious company, reveling in numerous affairs, and generally scandalous behavior. Publius Clodius Pulcher, that character again, uh, was a good friend of his, um, and who was a Pulcher was one of the leaders of the many factions within the Roman mob uh, and generally a supporter of Julius Caesar. Antony was a general carouser and gambler and was rumored to be indebted to the sum of 250 talents, which would be several millions of pounds today. Um, prospects for the young man didn't seem too outstanding. He leaves Rome, though, to study rhetoric in Greece <clears throat> at an early age, and that seems to have been a, a positive turn in his life. And he appears to have possessed some natural skill for oratory as well. While in Greece, Antony joined the cavalry under Aulus Gabinius, uh, Gabinius rather, and campaigned in Syria as well as other eastern borders 
other eastern conflicts on the borders of the empire. Um, he eventually ended his tour in Alexandria in Egypt, where he helped re reinstall King Ptolemy the Twelfth Aulites. Um, though inconsequential at the time, it's quite possible that Antony first crossed paths with his future lover and the eventual queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, who was 14 at the time. <clears throat> in 54 BC, Julius Caesar called on the promising young commander to join his staff in Gaul. Um, he wasn't Caesar's right-hand man at that, at that point. Labienus was. Um, uh, but Antony would become one of Caesar's most trusted and able subordinates, nonetheless, on his general staff. However, Antony's rather overbearing personality seems to have created problems that would plague him throughout his life. Um, though Caesar supported Antony for the office of Quaestor in 52 BC and continued to keep him on his staff, uh, there were rifts between the two that must have soured him and Caesar's, soured Caesar's opinion of him. In 50 BC, as the Civil War approached, Antony was elected to the office of Tribune and will recall his role in attempting to veto actions by the Optimatus faction against Caesar when Caesar was trying to run in absentia, but, but that Antony would eventually be compelled to flee Rome. Pardon me. Um, where he was, well, it, was, it wasn't simply that he was vetoing things against Caesar. He was uh, stirring up the mob against the supporters of the other side, and this required him, well, it forced him out of Rome by the, by the Optimatus faction. He then goes to Cisalpine Gaul to tell Caesar what's happened and uh, will provide part of the pretext for Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. <clears throat> we might recall Cicero's words on this blaming, laying the blame he very heavily at, at Antony's feet for um, Caesar starting the Civil War. At the Battle of Pharsalus, Antony commanded the left wing of Caesar's army. After Pharsalus, uh, Caesar, who was dictator, continued on to, to Egypt and Africa, leaving Antony as master of horse, Magister Equitum, in command of Rome. Here it seems that Antony's behavior finally alienated him from Caesar. Uh, he allowed his economic and the economic and social order within Rome to crumble and turn to violence as a solution. Hundreds of citizens were killed, we're told, in Antony's attempts to maintain civic order uh, with the obvious disapproval from Caesar and his fondness for clemency. Uh, by the time Caesar returned victorious from Antony, from Africa, rather, Antony was replaced by Lepidus, who will be one of the triumvirs, and Antony fell out of Caesar's inner circle for nearly two years. Eventually, Antony reestablished his importance within Caesar's circle, um, however, and played a, a pivotal role. In 44 BC, he joined Caesar as consul, um, and it was he who offered Caesar the diadem, you might recall, at the Lupercalia festival of that year. He continued to support Caesar's agenda and certainly was instrumental in forcing through many honors for the great conqueror. After Caesar's assassination um, in March of, of 44 BC, 15th of March, Antony was apparently surprised to find uh, he wasn't a target. Although some speculate that he may have been at least distantly involved in the plot, his behavior after the murder suggests otherwise. And this is, of course, what Cicero suggests that um, Trebonius, a, a man who was part of, of the conspiracy, had approached um, Antony and Narbo with a plot to kill Caesar. Um, what Antony did is not clear. It doesn't look as if he, he certainly doesn't seem to have been involved in the actual plot when it happened. Did he tell Caesar about it? Did he not tell him? We're not sure. Um, Cicero argues that he's guilty by, by implication, um, and, and Plutarch will repeat more or less that um, allegation, but but we don't know uh, because you you'd think that if he were involved in the conspiracy, he would have then sided with Brutus and Cassius, but he doesn't. So after reconciling, at least in theory, with Caesar's assassins and perhaps fearing loss of power, he delivered the famous funeral oration that then rallied the, the mob against um, against uh, the other conspirators, and we saw how uh, he then jockeys for position and, and, and gets the province of Cisalpine Gaul from Decimus Brutus by force, resulting in a conflict that would lead to the Second Triumvirate. Now, his relationship with Cleopatra will be a dominant 
a major feature of, 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 the, of his life and indeed of the latter part of the triumvirate and the civil war that ensues. So it's worthwhile, I think, to discuss Cleopatra a little bit as well. So who is this Cleopatra? Her name in full, Cleopatra the Seventh Philopater, beloved of her father, or loves her father, uh, was born, well, she's a member of, of the Ptolemaic dynasty that rules Egypt at this time. They inherited the throne or took it by force, depending on how you wish to interpret it, after Alexander the Great died in 323 BC. Ptolemy was one of Alexander's generals, nominally governor of Egypt and then later Pharaoh. So they are the last dynasty to rule Egypt, um, a European dynasty, uh, and Cleopatra is the last of the, well, her son Caesarion will be the last of the Ptolemies, as we shall see. So Cleopatra was born in 69 BC and for a while ruled jointly with her father, Ptolemy XII Aletes, the flute player. Her father had been exiled through a complex series of court intrigues and interfamily conflict. More Ptolemies died through the actions of their own family members than by any other means. Um, they also had an unusually high, uh, successfully high birth rate thanks to the medical school at Alexandria. Um, because, and, and why was the medical school so good? Well, because Ptolemy I allowed them to vivisect live prisoners. Um, but, the, you know, as grisly and horrible and, 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 and immoral as that is, their level of med medical technology wasn't really exceeded until the 19th century, and we're still using techniques that they developed. Um, Ptolemy fled to Rome. He managed to re Ptolemy the Twelfth managed to regain his throne through hefty bribes, and this is this is where Antony first comes into Egypt, um, and Pompey Magnus as well. Um, when she was 18 years old, her father died, leaving her the throne because Egyptian tradition held that a woman could not be pharaoh, uh, but needed a male consort to rule. She, her 12-year-old her brother Ptolemy the Thirteenth, was ceremonially, ceremonially, ceremonially rather married to her, um, but she soon dropped his name from all official documents. The Ptolemies uh, insisted on Macedonian Greek superiority, insisting rather on it had ruled in Egypt for centuries, mostly without learning the Egyptian tongue or embracing the customs, except in an official capacity. Cleopatra, however, was fluent in Egyptian eloquent in her native Greek and proficient in many other languages as well. Uh, she was supremely well educated and had a fiercely independent character and was beloved by her subjects from what we can tell for embracing their culture whereas others hadn't. The, the historian Plutarch writes, it was a pleasure merely to see to hear the sound of her voice with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from one language to another, so that there were few of the barbarian nations that she needed, she answered by an interpreter. Um, and in 48 BC, it was her chief advisor, Pothinus, along with the other, with another named Theodotus of Chios and her general Achelos, who who overthrew Cleopatra and placed Ptolemy the Thirteenth on the throne. And we've seen how uh, she became allies with Julius Caesar, uh, who then helped to restore her to the throne and then would have a child with her, a Caesarian. What's Mark Antony's relationship with her? Well, um, so when Caesar's assassinated, Cleopatra had to flee Rome with Caesarian, returning to Alexandria. As we've seen, Caesar's right-hand man, Mark Antony, uh, joined with Octavian and Lepidus to pursue and defeat the, the liberators. Um, in 41, Cleopatra was summoned to appear before Antony in Tarsus to answer charges that she'd been giving aid to Brutus and Cassius. So she's in the territory that Antony now controls, um, and, and pardon me, Antony summons her. Um, in fact, she had promised them aid, perhaps for political reasons, but didn't actually send it. Cleopatra delayed in coming, and then delayed further in complying with Antony's summons, making it clear that as Queen of Egypt, she would come in her own time when she saw fit. Egypt was at that time teetering on the edge of economic chaos, but even so, Cleopatra made sure to present herself as a true sovereign, appearing in luxury on her barge, 
dressed as Aphrodite. According to Plutarch, she came sailing up, sailing up the river Cydnus um, on a barge with, with gilded stern and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes and fifes and harps. She herself lay under a canopy of cloth of gold, dressed as Venus in a picture, uh, and beautiful young boys like painted cupids stood on either side of her. Her maids were dressed like sea nymphs and graces, some steering at the rudder, some working at the ropes. Perfumes diffused themselves from the vessel to the shore, which was covered with multitudes of people, part, sh part following the galley at the river on either bank, part running out of the city to see the sight. The marketplace was quite emptied, and Antony at last was left alone, sitting upon his tribunal chair while the, the word went through all the city that Venus was come to feast with Bacchus for the common good of Asia. <clears throat> Mark Antony and Cleopatra seem to have instantly become lovers and would remain so for the next ten years. She would bear him three children, and he considered her his wife, even though he was married first to, uh, to Fulvia and then to Octavia, the sister of Octavian. He eventually divorced Octavia to marry Cleopatra, according to the Egyptian tradition, if not recognized under Roman law. Although traditionally regarded as a great beauty, um, ancient writers uniformly praise her intelligence and charm over her physical attributes. Plutarch writes of Cleopatra, Her own beauty, so we are told, was not of that incomparable type that immediately captivates the beholder. But the charm of her presence was irresistible, and there was an attraction in her person and in her conversation that, along with a peculiar force of character in her every word and action, laid all who associated with her under her spell. Cleopatra continued to cast the same spell throughout the centuries, um, has done since her death, and remains one of the most famous queens of ancient Egypt. Movies, books, television shows, and plays have been produced about her life. She is depicted in works of art in every century up to the present day. Though she was Macedonian Greek and not Egyptian, she has come to symbolize ancient Egypt in the popular imagination um, more so than any other Egyptian monarch. During these years with Cleopatra, Antony's relationship with Octavian would easily disinte steadily disintegrate to the point where civil war broke out. Octavian would eventually have uh, her son, Caesarian, murdered and her children by Antony brought up and brought to Rome where they were raised by Octavia, ending the Ptolemaic line of Egypt, Egyptian rulers. <clears throat> but back to our story. So in 37 BC, Antony departs for his Parthian campaign. En route, he meets Cleopatra in Syria, uh, where she presented him with twins. Yeah. She had borne him after he left for Brundisium. Um, he acknowledged the children, naming the boy Alexander Helios, the sun, and the girl Cleopatra Selene, the moon. Antony married Cleopatra according to the Egyptian ceremony, and she conceived another child, later named Ptolemy Philadelphus. When Octavia returned from Rome to Athens to meet her husband with gifts and supplies, he ostensibly bypassed her and Greece, which was a direct and public insult to his legitimate wife, traveling directly to Alexandria and Cleopatra. As a coin minted under the joint authority of Cleopatra and Antony in Alexandria indicates the rulers were not attempting to idealize or romanticize their appearance, but rather to stress her royal authority and his leadership and their joint leadership together. So, um, Antony's Parthian debacle, right? Uh, this would be an attempt to, uh, to deal with those events that Caesar uh, didn't quite manage to finish, Crassus's uh, defeat. We'll come back to that in a minute. I want to talk briefly about um, some events that go on in with the triumvirs, uh, and this has to do with Lepidus. So, um, well, two things, really. One is, 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 is the Parasine War. Uh, this happens in, in early 41 BC, when Octavian returns from Philippi. Uh, he attempts to settle 40,000 veterans. He has major problems in this task. A promise made that the legionaries would receive rich and fertile land around 18 major cities in Italy proved difficult to keep because people already own that land. Um, the current inhabitants were going to be displaced. 
And it starts a war uh, in Perusia, led by, curiously enough, Mark Antony's brother and his wife, Fulvia. <clears throat> Although apparently it had nothing to do with Antony himself. Antony seemingly had no involvement. Um, he probably hoped to gain something at, at Octavian's uh, expense. So uh, Lucius, his brother, gathered the forces loyal to Antony, marched on Rome. Octavian was forced to withdraw to Etruria, where he could prepare his men. Lucius realized his position was untenable, head, headed north to Cisalpine Gaul. Um, he was faced with a serious threat from Sextus Pompey in... Uh, sorry, Octavian was also faced with a threat from Sextus Pompey in Sicily at the time, so things in the west, while Antony was away, were, were starting to, uh, to, to become problematic for Octavian. Um, Octavian cut off Lucius's retreat, besieged him at Perusia, effectively eliminating the threat of coordination with Antony's men in Gaul, which is what Lucius Antony was intending to do, to go up to Gaul and connect with Antony's army. After a short siege, Lucius realized that help was not going to come, and rather than starve to death, he surrendered. So by February of 40 BC, the so-called Parisine War ended as Lucius gave up the town. Likely fearing reprisal from his fellow triumvirs, Triumvir, Octavian took no action against Lucius Antonius or Antony's wife Fulvia, but exacted revenge on the town itself. He had 300 senators and other allies of Antonius executed. The town magistrates were put to the sword, apart from one that had apparently supported um, the, the condemnation of Caesar's assassins some years earlier. And the town itself was opened up to his men for pillage, so Octavian allows a Roman town to be pillaged by his, his army. He also formed an alliance at the same time with Sextus Pompeius, the son of Pompey the Great, who was given control of Sicily um, as a way to deal with this. Now, what happens to Fulvia, we don't entirely know, but she, but she dies not long after this, um, curiously enough. Um... Sextus Pompey would be a problem, though. He had, he had led, this is Pompey's youngest son, he had led a band of pirates between 43 and 36 BC, um, gaining a position amongst the Pompeians after the death of his father in 48. Uh, he was one of the benefactors of, of, of Julius Caesar's clemency policy uh, following the assassination of Caesar. Uh, he received a senatorial command of a fleet along the Italian coast, being awarded the title of Praefectus Classis et Ori uh, Maritima, Prefect of the Fleet and the Coasts on the Sea. Um, but when the Second Triumvirate came to power, pardon me, his name was on the list of those prescribed, proscribed rather, um, and by August of 45 BC, his naval command was outlawed. He fled to Sicily, uh, where he continued to lead his, his sort of resistance fighters in the form of pirates. He did manage to form an alliance with Mark Antony around 40 BC, but this was quickly broken. Under the, un, under the favorable terms received by Antony at the Conference of Brundisium in 40 BC, any support from Sextus was no longer necessary on Antony's part, and by 39, Sextus was once again attacking shipping, but the, the, this time his raids endangered the vital corn supply of Rome. Um, so Octavian and Antony decide to meet with this pirate, who had become known as, as the master of the Mediterranean during the spring of 39 BC. Um, a conference was called at Messinium, yielding what became known as the Treaty of Messinium. And according to the terms of the treaty, Sextus agreed to respect Italy, to leave the corn shipments alone, and to cease all hostilities. In return, he was given a position of respect and a promise of an augur ship, as well as a consulship. Sextus was given Corsica, Sicily, and the Peloponnese, which would ensure his election as consul. And Plutarch describes the meeting as follows. I'm not going to read out Plutarch's description, except to say that when they met, um, one of one of, Anton, one of Sextus's subordinates said to, to Sextus, Shall I cut the ship's cables and make thee master not of Sicily and Sardinia, but of the whole Roman Empire? Implying they, would, they were on a ship when they had this meeting, that he would cut the cables, sail out to sea, and kill Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus. Um, but supposedly Pompey re responded, Minas, you ought to have done this without speaking to me about it beforehand, but now let us be satisfied with things as they are, for perjury is not my way. Um, he then, after the feast, sailed back to Sicily. 
Uh, but this truce, as, as that quote suggests, even if it's not true, it suggests that the truce was an uneasy one. Um, within a short time, Pompey complained that the Greek Peloponnese had been essentially raped of their value prior to his arrival, though both Antony and Octavian claimed that it had been Antony's right to secure tax profits prior to Pompey's takeover. To insult Pompey further, his Sardinian governor defected to Octavian, giving him control of that island, and in retaliation, Pompey's fleets began disrupting the grain supplies once again. So within a year of the Treaty of Mycenaeum, uh, the peace was, was being quickly unraveled. Um, but because of that treaty, most of Pompey's support within the Senate was gone because of breaking that treaty. Uh, Republican holdouts against Octavian and Antony seemingly grew tired of Sicilian exile, um, and the door to return remained open, joined at either Antony or Octavian's camps. So um, they would go to war with, with Sextus Pompey led largely by Agrippa, Marcus Agrippa, who is Octavian's uh, really second in command and, and military leader. He turned the tide of battle at Nalocus in September of 36 BC using a technique to grapple Pompey's swifter, more maneuverable ships, that, that Corvus technique again we think. Agrippa turned the tide and utterly defeated Pompey's fleet. Pompey fled to the east and never re-established a position of strength and was eventually destroyed by Anthony in 35 BC. However, Lepidus decides to take this opportunity to, to try and get some more things for himself. Um, in 36, Octavian and Lepidus attack Sicily, uh, which is, is still uh, more or less independent from their control. They're successful, but then Lepidus made his own bid for power and tried to use Sextus's legions to seize Sicily. This failed, and he was exiled to a villa near Cape Circe. His role in the Second Triumvirate was at an end. Octavian took over his province of Africa. Antony had departed for his Parthian campaign in 37, but met Cleopatra in Syria and presented, her with it, presented him with his newborn children. So Lepidus is, is out from that point, um, and he keeps the title of Pontifex Maximus, but on the condition that he leaves it in his will to Octavian, who will then inherit it. Now, I was going to talk about Antony's campaign in Parthia. So that, that brings us up to that. Uh, remember that Crassus had been defeated at Carhai um, and, uh, and, and, and lost most of his army, including and lost his head and several... Uh, Roman military standards and and the eagle of the eagles of the legions. Um, this was was a problem, and it, it was something that Caesar had intended to deal with before he was assassinated. Um, and now it's Mark Antony's turn, being governor, if you like, of the East. Um, as, 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 we still call it a triumvirate, even though Lepidus is no longer technically anything, um, because his role as, as triumvir Antony is uh, required to go and fight the Parthians. Um, now, as it happens, his subordinate, one Publius Ventidius Bassus, uh, was, was doing reasonably well um, against them. And it's worth pointing out that one of Caesar's, uh, sorry, one, one of, uh, yeah, one of, the, one of the soldiers who had supported Caesar Labienus uh, was helping out the Parthians well at this time. Ventidius, though, uh, who, who was, who was, um, who was Antony's subordinate, was doing rather well in the provinces, uh, or rather well against the Parthians, and then this seems to have been embarrassing to Antony. So um, when news of, of Ventidius's victories reached Rome, there was great rejoicing, apparently, but not at the house of Mark Antony. It wouldn't do for his subordinate to uh, gain all the, the, the glory, victories and glory. Antony had to be present to claim the prize, so he immediately departs for the east. This is when he goes to Syria and meets his, his children. He's 47 years old at this time. Uh, it would be his first campaign against a foreign army. It's worth pointing out, Antony had fought beside Caesar in Gaul, but had not led. Um, he did lead the, right, the left wing at, at, at Pharsalus, but that was against Romans. He, most of his fighting outside of Gaul had been against other Romans, and it's also worth pointing out that Mark Antony had never led an expedition of this size 
before. Um, virtually all of his previous experience had been fighting against other Romans, uh, and nevertheless, the highest glory for a Roman aristocrat was to defeat a foreign enemy, and ideally an exotic one. So Ventidius was, was made to return. Um, Antony sort of tarnishes his reputation by accusing him of taking a bribe. Whether he did or not, we don't know. Ventidius more or less drops out of history at this point. We don't know if, if he was murdered uh, or, or he, he was showered with praise, packed him off to Rome. Uh, the Senate voted him a triumph, the first ever against the Parthians. Um, and he seems to have retired and just disappeared from history at this point. Whether Antony put him out of the way, we, we don't know. Uh, Antony goes off to besiege the city of Samosata, uh, but growing tired of this, he accepts a bribe of 300 gold talents for ending it. Uh, he then goes to deal with Antigonus, who is a Parthian installed Jewish king in Jerusalem. Uh, Antony had the usurper arrested, flogged, and crucified to fill the kingly role in Jerusalem. Um, he put his friend Herod the Great on the throne. Antony then returned to Rome where he found that public opinion had turned against him in favor of Octavian. Um, the Parthians rally and, and, and resurge uh, in, in the east uh, led by one Phraates IV who had um, killed his father and his brothers. Um, 30 of his brothers and half-brothers, in fact, signaling the tenor of his reign. His aim was to retake um, territory that Rome had controlled or, or to eff effectively control as much of the east as possible. Uh, so Antony, then in Armenia, Armenia becomes the next sort of battleground. From his base in Syria, Mark Antony uh, assembled 60,000 legionaries, 10,000 Hispanic and Celtic cavalry, joined with an auxiliary force of 30,000 archers and slingers, light infantry from the Allies and client states. Um, missing from the ranks, though, were 20,000 Italian infantry that Octavian had promised him. Those never quite materialized. Antony meant to march off into Armenia, where King Artavastes II, uh, who had once encouraged and, and then betrayed Crassus, uh, added up 6,000 horses and 7,000 7, foot soldiers for the common cause. So this is a huge expedition that Antony is going off uh, to fight the Parthians with. It's said that Antony's army put fear into men's hearts as far away as India. But if Plutarch's to, be, to, to be believed, then Antony was, was less interested uh, in the Indus River uh, than the Nile being on his mind because uh, after a march of a thousand miles from Rome to Armenia, he didn't allow his Roman soldiers time to rest and refit, but marched at once into Parthian territory. Um, I put quite a lot, quite an extensive amount in the notes. Um, essentially, Antony was in such a hurry to fight the Parthians, he left his baggage train behind because they moved more slowly than the rest of the army. The baggage train was then attacked by the Parthians, and, um, and, and, and that was very problematic for, uh, for Antony because it, it then meant that um, his troops couldn't get supplied. So he had to, he had to effectively turn around and return home. Um, when the exhausted and bedraggled army reached Armenian territory, the Allied territory, the pursuers turned for home. He had lost as many as 20,000 men. Um, and another 8,000 more died after he reached the border with Armenia. Um, he marched his survivors on to Antioch. His wife, Octavia, who he married uh, Octavian's sister at that point, was traveling to meet him with money, supplies, and clothing for his soldiers. She also brought an additional um, 2,000 fully supplied troops, courtesy of her brother. Not the 20,000 promised, but um, at any rate. But he was... Defeated by his enemy and betrayed by his brother-in-law, Antony was furious. In Rome, he was seen as a villain due to his crushing losses at the hands of the barbarians and his ill-treatment of Octavia. She loyally continued to live in Antony's house and raise his children um, while he was dallying with Cleopatra in Egypt. Uh, but things were going to go against 
Antony, and, and while 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 Antony's away in the east, Octavian is stirring things up against him in Rome, and Antony doesn't help his own cause. Um, this comes in the in the form of the donations of Alexandria in 32 BC, giving away many territories of the Roman East to, to Cleopatra and her children, including Caesarian, um, declaring him to be Caesar's legal heir, formally divorcing Octavia, sending an official notice to Rome that she had, she and his children were to leave his house. Um, these actions were deeply unpopular in the Senate. Of its own accord, it swore an extraordinary oath of loyalty to Octavian, we're told. Then they stripped Antony of his consular authority and declared war on Egypt. Um, now, it's worth pointing out the, con the, don the donations of Alexandria, which seem to have been part of Antony's will, only put his children and Cleopatra's children nominally in charge of territories that Rome ruled, and some territories that Rome hadn't conquered yet. Um, so it wasn't as if he was giving it to them, he was just making them be in charge of it for Rome. But this was spun by Octavian to, to signify that that, that, Octavia, that that Antony was setting himself up as a king in the east. Um, and we're told that it was Cleopatra who gets named public enemy number one, not Antony. This says Cassius Dio, this was the reason they voted for war against Cleopatra, but they made no such declaration against Antony, forsooth knowing full well that he would become an enemy in any event, since he certainly was not going to prove false to her and espouse Caesar's cause, Caesar is Octavian at this point, and they wished to have the, this additional reproach to put upon him that he had voluntarily taken up war on the side of the Egyptian woman against his native country, though no ill treatment had been accorded him personally by the people at home. So um, the War of Hearts and Minds is already won in Rome by Octavian. Antony and Octavian will go to war. Um, this will last for uh, better part of a year. War breaks out um, between Antony and Octavian. Uh, in 31, Octavian scored a tactical victory, successfully landing his troops on the, uh, the Greek island of Corfu um, and began to march south, trapping Antony and Cleopatra while Agrippa cut them off at the sea. The climactic battle uh, occurred off the promontory of Actium in Greece. Octavian's general was the shrewd Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, and Antony was hampered by defections among his own officers, along with the presence of Cleopatra and her flagship, which apparently dispirited his troops somewhat. Um, Agrippa easily outmaneuvered Antony and Cleopatra, who, who then fled and go back to uh, Egypt to Alexandria. The final issue of the matter occurs in 31 BC, or just after, sorry, in 30 BC. Um, plans to regroup their forces fail in Egypt, um, and most of Antony's remaining soldiers will divert, or sorry, will desert to join Octavian. Antony committed suicide with his own sword. The circumstances surrounding his death are not clear, um, but several versions state that Cleopatra sent him a message that she had committed suicide, whereupon he then stabbed himself. And the implication is that she was trying to cozy up to Octavian Caesar. If that's the case, it didn't work. Caesar, Octavian intended to probably bring her back to Rome and drag her before the Senate and people in his triumph, but she would steal a march on him and commit suicide herself. So, um, and, and you can see the coins that Octavian issued to commemorate the victory over uh, Egypt. So some show a crocodile uh, with the, the legend, Aegypto Capta, Egypt has been captured. Um, others show um, military trophies and things of that nature, which you can see. Octavian was no stranger to spin, and he was very successful at it. He's the last man standing, right? Lepidus has been neutralized. Antony is dead. Um, the whole of the Roman Empire is now under Octavian. And on, in 27 BC, Octavian formally hands over his power to the Senate, which then voluntarily gives it back to him in a new legal form, officially declaring him Princeps, first citizen, instead of dictator, king, or triumvir. He was henceforth called Augustus, the revered one, 
after which the month of August was named. The word princeps derives from princeps senatus, or primus inter pares of the Senate, first amongst equals. Um, the princeps senatus was the first member by precedence of the Roman Senate. In effect, absolute power was put into Augustus's hands, but this was concluded by his continuous, or concealed by his continuous use of the old governmental forms, at least in principle. Although Augustus' rule is often termed a principate, it was actually the first, he was actually the first of the Roman emperors, um, who also used the title princeps up to the time of Diocletian. And the beginning of the Roman Empire is officially dated to 27 BC, or the imperial regime. Uh, the empire had been around for some time, as we know. Thank you very much for your attention, um, and that's all for now.